Thank you so much, everyone, uh, and welcome to the session today on deepening impact, unraveling layers of informality in business ecosystems. Uh, we're very glad to be joined by an esteemed panel today. But before we get into the discussion, just wanted to ensure uh, we share with you that uh, we have interpretation services available because we have uh, our worker colleagues join us as well in this panel and would like uh, to both hear from them in a language they're comfortable, but also relay back the rest of the session to them. So we have Hindi to English and, and vice versa as part of the panel. If you'd like to log in, uh, you can use that. Um, before I get started and get the inputs, um, you know, of our, our guests today, um, just want to set a little bit of context. Uh, we are coming back to Sankalp to share about the social compact. We did so last year as well. Uh, the social compact, as some of you may know, some may not, uh, has been a two year old journey for us, uh, which we started right after the first wave of the pandemic, bringing industry and worker organizations into a co-solutioning relationship uh, to ensure that those who are informally engaged as workers within industry uh, can actually get access to basic dignity and equity uh, through their working day and as part of contributors to the business. Just to set the context before we dive deeper, we're speaking of something like 200 million informal workers who are engaged in different layers and levels of industry ecosystems, starting from those who are fixed term employees and contracted workers at the very top all the way down to those who are in the supply chain at the seventh, eighth, sometimes deeper levels of company. For us, the journey has been exciting, um, real, banal sometimes, sometimes challenging. Um, we are today working with 40 principal and supply chain companies in the compact, uh, along with our partners, uh, you know, Ajivika Buran Center for Social Justice. And for us, as we've gone through this journey, it's always been rejoicing the baby steps we make forward, but also constantly questioning ourselves and grounding ourselves uh, and sobering ourselves down to say how much more of the challenge uh, we are yet to get to fathom and address. And so today's panel is actually about uh, taking some of those challenges uh, right on. Uh, while we have been able to create a framework and a movement that is beginning to set systems uh, kind of right for those who may be fixed term employees and often contracted employees at the very top companies. Um, I think we're still on a daily basis challenged by the question of uh, how do we make social compact count for the lesser visible layers of the supply chain uh, not as something that is forced down upon them, but as something that they understand the value of. But then also, how do we have some of this go to those who are floating populations serving industry nevertheless, be those uh, daily wage workers uh, that often work as construction workers or helpers within manufacturing and other formal industries, but also those uh, who are a growing community of gig platform workers. We will be exploring some of these demographics today in this panel. Um, and I'd actually like to first start with um, uh, Lily and Divya from Papa Don't Preach, one of uh, Social Compact's uh, companies, to understand a little bit about, uh, from you, Lily. Uh, hi. Kesa lag rahe? Hi. Acha lag rahe. <laughs> आपका बहुत-बहुत स्वागत है यहाँ पे हमारे साथ जुड़ने के लिए थैंक यू थैंक यू मुझे भी इनवाइट करने के लिए आपसे थोड़ा सा पूछना था कि आपका सफर पीडीपी के साथ कैसे स्टार्ट हुआ और आज आप उनके साथ क्या काम करते हैं मेरा सफर 2013 से स्टार्ट हुआ है मैम के साथ में पापा डोंट प्रिच में बहुत हार्ड था तब वो सफर एकदम हार्ड से मैंने खुद से अपने से बलबूते पे मैंने सीखा है पूरा काम वहां पर छोटे से हम लोग का डिजाइन का था वहां से लेके अब तक इतना प्रोग्रेस हुआ है कि काफी प्रोग्रेस हुआ और काफी चेंजेस भी आ गया है सब चीज में और सब मतलब कैसे ऐसे डिपार्टमेंट भी बना है अलग अलग तरीके का डिपार्टमेंट हो गया है फैब्रिक का डिपार्टमेंट मटेरियल का डिपार्टमेंट अलग तरीका के पूरा डिपार्टमेंट हो गया है 
तो आप शुरू से किसी डिपार्टमेंट में काम करते थे या आप पहले क्या काम करते थे पीडीपी में पहले वहां पर मैं क्लीनिंग से लेकर पूरा फैब्रिक शॉप मेंटेन मटेरियल जो भी फैब्रिक का ऑर्डर देना तब वहां पर ऐसे डिपार्टमेंट नहीं था जब छोटा ऑफिस में इतना बड़ा हो गया कि यहाँ पर सब रूल्स एंड रेगुलेशन चालू हुआ है तो अब आप जो अब आप क्या काम करते हैं अभी मैं फैब्रिक मेंटेनिंग का जो भी स्टॉक मेंटेन है वो करती हूँ मैं वहां पर यहाँ पर पे और अब आप क्लीनिंग और बाकी हेल्पिंग का काम अभी नहीं करते नहीं नहीं क्लीनिंग वगैरह नहीं करती हूँ काफी प्रोग्रेस हुआ है ऑफिस में अभी हमारे पे यहाँ पर तो इस चेंज से आपके वेतन में या आपके जो निजी स्तर है उसमें कुछ जब मैं जब ज्वाइन हुई थी तब मेरा वेतन फाइव थाउजेंड था अभी मेरा वेतन ट्वेंटी वन है अच्छा और जब सोशल कॉम्पैक्ट की टीम आ, आपके आपके साथ थोड़ा बात करने के लिए आए थे कि आपकी कंपनी में क्या आपको सुविधाएं मिलती हैं वेतन के अलावा तो आपने आ, कुछ मांगे रखी थी उनके सामने कुछ बातें बत, आ, पूछी थी उनसे उसके बारे में थोड़ा सा बताएं उनको मैंने ये बोला था जब वो हमारे पास में आए थे कंपनी काफी ठीक है वेतन भी सही मिलता है मेरे बेटी के स्कूल की फी भी मैडम देती है वहां पर मैंने इनको ये बोला था कि यहाँ पर पीएफ वगैरह नहीं है तो ये होना चाहिए मैंने क्वेश्चन किया था अभी यहाँ पर आई हूँ हेल्थ इंश्योरेंस हुआ है हमारा चालू ये वाले ऑफिस में न्यू वाले तो काफी फ्रेंडली माहौल था मगर इस बारे में आपने पहले कभी बात नहीं करी मैडम से पीएफ के बारे में या आपने सुना है कि मेडिकल नहीं तब उसके... तब मैंने कुछ बात नहीं की थी क्योंकि तब हमारा छोटा सा ऑफिस था वहां पर इतना नहीं था वहां पर कुछ तो तब फिर दूसरे ऑफिस में जब आए थे तब ये आए थे बोलने के लिए तब मैंने उनको बोला था कि ऐसा ऐसा होना चाहिए और मैं भी पीएफ वगैरह के मैंने बाहर से मैंने सुना था कि इसका बेनिफिट क्या है क्या नहीं इसलिए मैंने इनको फिर क्वेश्चन कैसे ऐसे होना चाहिए बराबर आपने जब ज्वाइन किया था तब आप ही के जैसे और महिलाएं भी थी संस्था में हाँ एक संस्था में थी वो शशि नाम की लेडी थी तो और आज पीडीपी में कितनी महिलाएं काम कर रही हैं आज पीडीपी में काफी महिलाएं काम कर रहे हैं अच्छा मैं दिव्या से भी पूछना चाहूंगी दिव्या आ, हम जब आपसे मिलने के लिए आए थे सोशल कॉम्पैक्ट में तब कोई डिपार्टमेंट में लेडीज एज सच नहीं थी कुड यू टेल अस अ लिटिल बिट अबाउट द इनसाइट ऑफर्ड एंड एंड व्हाट इज नाउ द चेंज यू हैव ब्रॉट अबाउट इन योर कंपनी यस फर्स्टली हाय एवरीवन आई एम दिव्या फ्रॉम पापडोन प्री अम सो जस्ट टू गिव अ लिटिल मोर कॉन्टेक्स्ट वी हैव अम वी हैव अ इन हाउस मैन्युफैक्चरिंग कंप्लीटली सेट अप इन द लास्ट अम ऑलमोस्ट अ ईयर and um, in our production unit uh, we actually it was completely male dominated um is still the percentage of uh, male carriers are much more higher than what we have as females um and um, i think one of the first uh, mirrors that was put in front of us the initial visits from uh, dastras team and uh, ajivika bureau was we really don't have any females in the manufacturing uh, departments of our unit so this is not even considering our uh, team members this is just the manufacturing aspect and uh, what we uh, really brought in was just we essentially created an entire small department to start off with, with where we could hire more women um um it's it's our thread cutting and finishing department so and also we have started trying to bring in more female uh, tailors in the unit and it just came down to a lot of our hiring positions is uh, taken by men right now it's being held by men and there's a lot of hesitancy in trying to um, it's if i have a tailoring unit the supervisor and the master jis are the one taking a call on who's being hired 
so where that sort of becomes uh, our reliance on them to be able to okay these are this is the team i want to build so for us take respecting their decisions and while simultaneously trying to get in a little more um, get in a little more balance in the and more representation in the unit is sort of the challenge we are trying to work through right now but we started out with uh, zero women in the manufacturing department last year to uh, 20 women currently who's been working as a separate department so that's and cool. any any changes is it slowing down business is it improving business definitely so uh, to get a, to give a little more context on which what department is this uh, we have a ha- uh, in house hand embroidery section so uh, between hand embroidery and it uh, and it and the fabric going to stitching department uh, there is a step of thread cleaning and finishing it off and checking the product before it is sent to the stitching department for the final production so this was initially done by our uh, kaigers who are working on the fabric also but uh, as a production perspective now the kaigers handed over to the ladies who are running the department and they can start their uh, production on the next piece so sort of reduces the buffer time in between uh, one uh, those kaigers sitting on the first product and going on to the next product obviously from a production efficiency point of view definitely a lot of reduction in buffering and wastage of time in the unit so yes it has benefited us uh, in terms of our production efficiency um and we are still observing like how better it can get thank you the reason uh, for asking this question also for the benefit yes. of the audience is that a lot of what we are doing in the social compact is new and we are constantly asked why change the status quo chal to raha hai kyun chal badhane ki ya chai change karne ki zarurat hai but it's only when we see the change and we see what is the impact of it will a business case come of it and that's why it's critical for us to keep documenting uh, what are the changes and challenges uh, that that come about as we see some of these changes in the way industry thinks and acts on a daily basis thank you divya and lily thank you so much for your time जैसे कि आपने देखा एक कंपनी है पीडीपी एक और कंपनी है जिसके साथ हमने सप्लाई चेन के अंदर और ज्यादा काम करना शुरू किया मेरे साथ मकरंद एंड्रे हाउस से हाय मकरंद हाउ यू डूइंग यू आर म्यूट कैन यू हियर आस Yes, yes. I am able to hear you. Only, uh, I think there is some lag in the network. Yeah. So, yeah. I am doing good. So, yeah. Makran, thank you for joining us. If you could give us a little bit of context on uh, your motivation as a company for joining the compact and some of your learnings or observations as you've gone through this journey, would be very valuable. Okay. <clears throat> okay so uh, good afternoon morning uh, to everyone and all present here in uh, this uh, global summit uh, sankalp i think 14th uh, sankalp global summit so i am privileged and honor uh, to be part of this particular summit uh, myself makarand lekar i am uh, uh, working in andres souther as assistant director and i am responsible for uh, quality management and uh, lean activities throughout the organization Actually, Andreessen Hauser uh, is a global multi, uh, it's a Swiss German multinational company, and uh, we have our uh, plant in Aurangabad, Maharashtra. We are uh, into the uh, business of uh, process automation, uh, that is instrumentation. We are producing all types of instruments like lay pressure gauges, level instruments, then temperature, flow measuring instruments, uh, then digital communication, and all. so uh, actually the main motivation makarand i think you are on mute we just lost you for a bit and you are a little faint could you be a little louder maybe you can hold the microphone closer if possible okay now are you able to hear me yeah a little closer would be valuable a little closer
you were quite clear when we started okay now uh, am i audible yes yes okay okay so why indrajan hazar has gone for social compact uh, evaluation uh, the mainly you know uh, we have we are doing we have been doing our uh, qms audit with all our suppliers and uh, we have this iso 45001 uh, which uh, actually covers the uh, osha uh, which is occupational health and safety management in which you know uh, normally we we our uh, audits are mainly focusing on the safety of the people of course and uh, the process yeah uh, uh, and the process but uh, actually the main part uh, of the people which is uh, i think was excluded and uh, that is the main reason why we wanted to go for uh, doing this evaluation because uh, in our evaluation uh, normally you know uh, the main uh, company employees are taken care but informal workers or contractual workers well being was not taken care so uh, as a socially responsible company uh, indrasa nauza we thought that we should do something and then we uh, uh, we started with that we should evaluate self first so we have undergone this particular evaluation first and then we thought we should also uh, extend it to our complete supply chain and while doing this uh, evaluation almost uh, 13 or 14 suppliers we have completed so far and uh, i was also uh, involved in all these evaluation so uh, i think it was a really very great experience for me and social compact is an excellent initiative uh, by which there is a lot of awareness which is brought in in the organization leadership you know i have experienced that uh, you know the leadership actually wants to uh, implement lot of things for uh, the people uh, but mainly uh, the part in the communication and the awareness and uh, you know when we have given this particular feedback after our evaluation i think they were really really positive and uh, wanted to implement all the things and the same thing was uh, with the workers that uh, you know uh, many people you know in various government scheme uh people who are not at all uh, aware of and uh, for example uh, they are uh, having you know the esic has been cutting from long time with them but they don't know the benefit you know we have uh, seen some people they have taken 10 days leave but they don't know that they can get all this money from esic back and i think this is just the awareness and the training and education to the people i think uh, uh, with this particular evaluation i think this is the uh, the main uh, result which i will i see that this awareness is been created and also we are planning to conduct some camps uh, of uh, csd and uh, ajivika bureau uh, for uh, the registration and creating awareness on the benefits of all these various schemes and the uh, es and pf and all so i think uh, uh, this is the main uh, uh, take away for us from social compact and uh, for the follow up uh, uh, we have a particular system in our regular audit that we make a complete follow up sheet with the actions and uh, uh, the due dates and who will do that so such type of action list we have created for uh, all our suppliers and uh, they are supposed to come up with the actions first with the due dates and then uh, we have made a planner uh, into the digital workplace by which uh, they are getting automatic reminders for their actions if the actions are overdue so this is how we are following with uh, all the action and i think uh, uh, people uh, the leadership uh, in the organization are also really positive for doing all this evaluation and uh, uh, you know uh, since uh, uh, this has particular initiative is going to be coming from various suppliers to them so i think this has uh, uh, really made some positive impact so i think uh, uh, there is a definitely long way to go uh, in this journey uh, in the workers well being practices in india however this has uh, at least started and i think this baby steps towards the uh, welfare of the people so for uh, personally myself is a uh, really satisfying and fulfilling 
journey doing all these evaluations along with social compact i would like to really thank dasra ajivika bureau and center for social social justice for uh, uh, accompanying me on these all so uh, uh, evaluation and i think uh, to end my speech uh, uh, i would like to quote a very beautiful quote from swami vivekananda discover the joy of giving and you will discover the reason for living thank you so much thanks makaran i just wanted to add are you foreseeing any challenges from the supply chain as you implement this across them is everybody's reaction consistent is everyone seeing value in it or you're getting some difficult questions uh yeah actually you know when initially when uh, uh, we we were trying to uh, when we sent this question and then also they were reluctant definitely and uh, when we explained them the motive behind and uh, uh, the reason why we are doing this i think then they understood it and uh, you know after the actions also you know when we had given the feedback so there were uh, for some things there were little bit hesitance but i think uh, it's just uh, just the matter of uh, uh, you know uh, it's just matter of uh, uh, things and awareness and things so they will uh, definitely understand it and will you be do you plan to continue the dialogue with them as they go down this journey i mean what some of the thought process on in addition to building awareness consistently are you thinking of are you going to make this part of a regular review uh are you going to make this part of your regular conversations with the suppliers what are some of the ongoing thought process yeah as uh, i explained in our follow up sheet uh, you know uh, we have uh, these particular actions and mm -hmm. normally in any closing meeting we uh, get them their agreement that all these actions they will implement so mm -hmm. once we have this agreement and uh, they they have given us and the due dates and who will uh, implement these actions so uh, then we follow up with the you know the digital workplace planner and they get the automatic reminder if the dates are overdue so this is how we are going to follow all the actions and hmm. since they have already agreed so they have to implement all got you and yeah. do they have the ability to also make a request of you in case they are in need of some kind of support of course of course i mean uh, for in every uh, uh in every uh, feedback uh, you know uh, at the end of our uh, evaluation uh, in the feedback session we have told them that uh, there is a center for uh, uh, justice the or the ajivika bureau there is a worker facilitation center which is nearby to their uh, their factory so they can take the help of them they can arrange some camps for, for the people awareness and the registration for uh, various uh, government scheme so i think uh, they are positive and uh, uh, of course uh, i think they will take the benefit or yeah. maybe in the follow up we will definitely talk to them uh, if they have taken the benefit or not yeah i also say this uh, also for the benefit of our audience as we've just started with our supply chain uh, with two to three companies it is becoming quite evident that it is an ongoing dialogue um, and having that room for a two way conversation is kind of critical to really make this a shared aspiration uh, rather than making it something that i say and you do um and you do whether you see value in it or not because that will just become a parallel legal system which we will find the first loophole to evade again um and it will not happen overnight it will also not happen with 100% of our supply chain partners overnight uh, but i think beginning the conversation sharing where we come from why we are doing this uh, and how we are offering an ecosystem of support as partners go down this journey is critical we also request all our companies to keep ears and hearts open for difficult asks and questions uh, that the supply chain will raise uh, to international and globally exposed companies uh, but thank you makaran thank you for being on this journey for being daring enough to go into 13 15 of your supply chain partners right in the first year uh, appreciate the learnings and way to go um Anjali I'll bring you in at this time you've spoken to the supply chain partners and at social compact we are always uh, in awe of this growing challenge of the gig worker who seems to be loving 
to some extent their life in the gig platform and the flexibility it brings but at the same time there are there is a whole counter narrative on the challenges that they have to face with regards to informality tell us a little more about i mean as zomato how do you see this worker the mentality of the worker what are some of your sharings with us thanks so much and thanks so much for having me um so i think that uh, the first thing that's really important to understand is this group is extremely diverse right we have about 3 lakh plus monthly active delivery partners uh, but it also means that about you know you could you could imagine that in a year uh, we uh, we might be onboarding somewhere close to 800000 delivery partners so th- this is a very very diverse group right and um, so the motivations are equally diverse but i would say the primary motivation that we have seen across is actually that of flexibility i think gig work has really unlocked the value of flexibility in a way that no other form of private informal work has before um so it's it's a you know it's it's the kind of work that enables we have delivery partners from hyderabad prashant from hyderabad who's pursuing his singing career because he is a gig he is he is a delivery partner with us there's Ar, um, arpita from jalandhar who can spend time with her son because she's a delivery partner and she's a single mother then there's um, godsen from tamil nadu who is a part time cricketing umpire in local tournaments because he's a delivery partner so and then there is um, another delivery uh, another mohammed from delhi who's been able to travel to places that he never he really wishes he could have he you know he had dreamed of visiting kashmir he visited bombay is planning for goa because he's a delivery partner with zomato so i think we've we really it really unlocks the value of that time you do there are no fixed hours you work when you want you take as many leaves as you want it's uh, in uh, there is nobody to ask for leave it is very much i mean how many of us still have to think twice before asking our boss for leaves right there is in uh, it's it's still a source of pressure there is one delivery partner from chennai who wasn't even able to take leave when his father was on his deathbed in his previous job you know so i i, I think we don't uh, i mean I, i think all of us have experienced and um, the the value of that flexibility but this is a population that has really converted it into um something of really great value in terms of uh, you know the priority that they place on it so that's mm-hmm. probably common across the board they all seeking flexibility of work the second important thing is it's a no questions asked kind of opportunity whether you're 10th pass 12th pass degree holder uh your the languages you speak the marks that you got whether you passed or failed actually none of that matters and again it's one of very few opportunities that doesn't require any documentation barring a pan card um and a driver's license and of course a, a you know police verification process but uh, apart from that it's um very low barriers to entry the third uh, aspect i think is you know so i mean these are really some of the i would say the uh, why people join why people uh, as delivery partners um in terms of uh, you know what are the uh, what are the challenges of course because the motivations are very diverse not everyone is in it for the long term right this is not they don't see this as a um permanent Uh, something sure. they might do permanently in fact most people are in it for either to uh, make additional income for a very fixed purpose right so uh, some people are looking to buy uh, you know even property perhaps because owning property is still uh, is it's, it's very aspirational for everybody so some people are looking to uh, make that additional income to uh, purchase property some people are looking to earn a little bit more because they have free time sure. to earn and we may as well use it towards that so i think that the sort of the fact that not everybody is in it for the long term is actually one of the key challenges of gig work because there are certain kinds of services that you can only channel effectively if your engagement with the worker is for a longer period of time the mm. delivery partners uh, that we work with 
typically work with us on an average of 30 to 35 hours a week uh, mm-hmm. between 30 to 35 hours and they, they and, you know 6 months later they could not be with our platform right and oh. there are some benefits that only come with um, a certain amount of time, even if we were to help them with certain kinds of government insurance schemes, some of those benefits take a very long time to uh, to to come. So, mm-hmm. for skilling, for instance, how much of skilling really delivers benefits in uh, in a day or two days, or you know, you it's it is really hard to uh, deliver certain kinds of benefits to this population. So and are like there said, some sorry are there some basic ones that you insure in any case for your delivery three lakh delivery partners? Yes, yes, there are. So health insurance, for instance, is something that we've uh, we don't. Uh, in fact, we've worked very very hard with our insurance partners to make sure all our delivery partners are covered by health insurance. There are three components to that. There's medical insurance of one lakh. Uh, for all delivery partners and then it goes up to 3 lakh and we're piloting that piloting that in uh, a few cities for their families as well but that's based on loyalty and tenure uh, there is um, a life insurance of 10 lakhs um, and then there is uh, and that covers expenses like funeral expenses there are also uh, there's also opd coverage up to 5000 rupees and uh, and all of this is uh, all these claims can be made through the app, which makes it again far more, you know, Makran was saying that one of the challenges is lack of awareness of a lot of insurance schemes, etc. Mm-hmm. But the work we've done towards that is really remarkable. It's resulted in a 5x increase in disbursals. So mm-hmm. we've made regional language videos for delivery partners oh. to understand. And then we've... Um, not only made this app based, but we've also given them a point of contact. So I think yeah. that the steps on awareness are equally important as having the facility itself, because often that is what uh, results in poor utilization yeah. of benefits. So I yeah. think those I mean, that's that's pretty important to do, and I would um, sort of call that out as a as an important uh, step we've taken. Anjali, um, I would. I, I just want to double click on that because Divya is coming next, and Divya, here's a point for us to note: we often struggle with our floating population-related benefits, and uh, you know, Somato has a pretty similar situation of these three lakh workers. I'm assuming Anjali are not the same every day, right? So, when do the benefits kick in? Uh, at what uh, stage or tenure is it applicable to your uh, to your delivery partners? And how have you convinced, who have you convinced as an insurance partner to provide that, that insurance for a floating population would be really helpful. So our uh, benefits kick in as soon as a delivery partner is onboarded. So for mm-hmm. well, we have, of course, we have a couple of criteria, but we've tried to design the criteria in such a way that if you are an active delivery partner and you are considered active from the moment that you're onboarded, And the first 14 days, even if you don't get a single order, you're still considered active. Um, And then, of course, there are other criteria, including like how, you know, how, uh, when was your last order, etc. So there is some amount of activity associated with it because we do, we needed to have that criteria. The insurance partner we worked with, ACO, essentially has been, you know, very, very proactive and progressive in, um, in helping us define these criteria. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I would say that we are um, every year, I, I mean, as in, compared to FY21, we have definitely improved our communication of these benefits. Mm-hmm. And that's made a whole lot of difference. Yeah, very valuable uh, and something for us to double click on for sure um, as we go through the social compact with some of our floating populations. But tell me, Anjali, what brought you into conversation with, uh, you know, the social compact given that you're a gig platform? Right. So, Sonri, I think uh, for me um, and and for Zomato, we recognize that there are some issues that we can solve working closely with private sector uh, ecosystem players like ACO, you know, there are sort of, solu- you know, and, and thanks to uh, VC funding, there are more and more uh, non-traditional fin- fintech players who are willing to, for instance, even consider vehicle finance for delivery partners who are otherwise sort of left out of the ambit of 
traditional finance uh, organizations right so but i do believe that there are areas like female delivery partner onboarding right where the challenges are so much in the ecosystem and um you know female women in india aren't allowed with t-shirts at you know and, and, and i'm just saying that the 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 barriers sure. begin at so many levels that we want um uh, you want partners in that for those especially for areas that matter and that are very very difficult to solve on your own you want partners um working with you uh, collaborating ideating um so that we can eventually make progress uh, getting more disabled delivery partners on board it um it, then you know like i i talked about upskilling earlier what is the right model what are the kinds of skills we can Uh, you know provide that are uh, that would be of value mm. and and how in what in what format because uh, this is a population that is uh, scarce on time yeah yeah no thank you anjali and we are looking forward to some of this creative thinking right it's uh, something that we learned from industry as feedback that there are some things in the realm of worker well being that are best left to worker organizations who have the orientation towards the worker uh, as opposed to private sector consultants or our private sector solution providers there's just something slightly different and we're looking forward to exploring some of those areas just like you mentioned whether it's sanitation and hygiene for our delivery partners on the roads all day or whether it is crashes or whether it is uh, you know gender culture building uh within the organization how we can bring the social compact ecosystem to your support would be uh quite exciting for us thank you for your time um and devya let me bring you in devya is my partner in prime from ajivika bureau um we started the social compact together um and devya as i started saying uh you know earlier as well one of the populations that we are always um uh, challenged by is that the herd almost as it is seen right which is so replaceable in the eyes of industry that it really doesn't matter uh, one goes ten come and it's all right uh, to ignore their basic needs tell us a little bit about this daily wage wage worker and what are some of the ways in which we can extend the soco model to their support yeah thank you thank you sonvi and um, thank you for inviting me inviting me to this platform um it's really been a privilege to be on this journey i would say um, uh, you know along with dasra and many of our esteemed uh, you know industry partners um, especially papa don preach and nh who spoke before me um just for the benefit of the audience ajivika bureau is a specialized uh, public service initiative and we work to ensure security and dignity uh, for india's informal and migrant workers um so as sonvi said i think we've been trying to you know through social compact reimagine many of the contours that define business uh, in india today and and i think one of the defining features really of in the indian business scenario is informality um, and daily wage workers really occupy uh, the very bottom rungs of the informal workforce in the country today um so just if we could imagine the scenario you know i was just in pune last week um and i was at this naka called bhosri labor naka in the morning so more than 2000 workers assembled every day morning in at this naka and nakas are just you know just for the benefit of a global audience um these are informal kind of congregation points on the road sides or under the flyovers where thousands of workers assemble every day just looking for work um and many of them are migrant workers um you know and in pune for example they were from within maharashtra um or even from far flung states like uttar pradesh and bihar um and some of them travel on their own some with their families including children um and in a large number of cases women also come to the nakas in the morning in the hope of getting work and trying to supplement the family income um and there are uh, more than 30 such labor nakas just between pimpri chinchwad and pune which are twin cities um so you can imagine the magnitude of people who assemble every day on the road sides of the cities of india just looking for livelihood um and while most of these nakas really cater to the construction sector there are also dedicated nakas within the industrial areas uh, that fulfill the more sporadic kind of demands for uh, a casual workforce and and several hundreds of people assemble at such nakas also on a daily basis um, you know just waiting for contractors or labor suppliers or the middlemen to pick them up um, and wage rates uh, you know work hours nature of tasks all of these are negotiated orally at the nakas without any form of written documentation um, so even when 
payment happens at the end of the day and any of these terms are violated there's really no means of holding the accountable or um, you know holding the contractor or the employer accountable for any of these violations um and and one of the biggest challenges in the scenario for workers is really the precarity of employment so when we talk about daily wage workers it's really the uncertainty of the employment scenario today that is the biggest challenge that they face uh, i would say uh, on any given day there is no guarantee that uh, they will be able to find work um so last week um, when we visited some of the you know residential settlements where these workers live they were saying that you know given the kind of economic recession that's going on right now in the country they are able to find less than 15 days of work in a month um and and given an average kind of wage rate of maybe 500 to 600 for a for an unskilled worker a helper um you know the monthly kind of uh, income that a household is able to make comes to barely 10000 a month which is much lesser than the you know stipulated minimum wage uh, in the country today and and one can imagine that women like um, anjali also spoke before me the kind of gender challenges that uh, you know women face in this scenario women are almost never paid at par with the male workers even if they do the same kind of work so they make even lesser so so many kind of gender challenges uh, that also goes unnoticed and um these workers are really outside the ambit of any kind of social protection schemes such as esic or provident fund or health insurance we heard um, you know lily in the beginning as well uh, because they are the rotating workforce uh, that constantly undertake you know movement from one employer to another um, and and the state for, for construction workers for example the state has stepped in with the uh, you know building and other construction workers welfare board but there's no equivalent scheme in the industrial sector for a more casual kind of daily wage kind of employers um, so for example um, in pune last week a worker came to our center four, four of whose fingers was chopped off um, he was barely 19 years old he was working in a in a um, um, automotive kind of a, a you know parts manufacturing unit in one of the industrial kind of clusters in pune um, and he was not registered in esic on the day of the accident he had barely started work and that's one of the major reasons because a lot of these workers come in with unskilled without any training very young and the work site itself is not safe so that's what in this is the frequency of these um, kinds of accidents um, the contractor completely refused to take any responsibility and 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 we are kind of trying to take that case forward to see how you know compensation can be delivered so so I, so maybe you know I, i'll just stop here in terms of this just to pay trying to paint a scenario of you know what are some of the challenges that workers face on a daily basis yeah and anything that we can do in this in addition to you know what you've just spoken of in the work of facilitation center context yeah absolutely so so uh, you know we run worker facilitation centers in two industrial areas currently um, uh, in pimpri chinchwad and in chakan and another third one is upcoming in the pune municipal corporation um, so at social compact our efforts have been really in the direction of you know invoking the principal employer and initiating interventions through vendors in their supply chains um, for these very kind of bottom end workers so we reach out to daily wage workers um, um, in uh, to ensure that they have their basic identity and domicile doc- humans in place you know we help enroll them in schemes such as eshram which has a um, accident insurance uh, kind of a product already built into it so that they, once they are enrolled in eshram they automatically have that kind of a coverage um, we facilitate their linkage with aadhar pan cards bank accounts mobile aadhar linkage um, so that they have a gateway to the you know whole social protection architecture in the country today because most of them are unbanked and you know digitally illiterate even functionally illiterate so so there is really you know very a grave absence of avenues for people to enroll into these schemes um so going ahead i would just say that you know we hope more and more industries can you know really delve deep into their supply chains because the very invisible casual daily wage um, you know vulnerable kind of workforce resides there is engaged in these sectors um and strategies need to be designed i think for incentivizing the identification and registration of these workers so that that can then be leveraged upon for their inclusion in social protection schemes um and of course we know that the social compact um, framework provides a really good road map in terms of you know what are the fundamental outcomes that need to be achieved for a good working environment so 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 automatically the daily wage workers who come in can if, if such an environment is established um, the benefits of an outcomes from such an environment can also percolate down to enhance protection for these workers yeah thank you divya uh, anand divya has painted the challenge for you um 
please do tell us a little bit about what good business lab does and tell me how can we bring the voice of this floating large population to whose ears and how i think the question really is that because if we heard i think we'd want to make a change or at least find the responsible biggies so to say uh, but how do we even begin listening to them what are those channels yeah sure thank you so much so good business lab is a uh you know a labor innovation company and we do research on worker well-being we essentially look for how worker well-being and business interests can intersect um we focus on areas such as gender skill development workplace environment and health and our work is spread across geographies from india to latin america us china southeast asia across multiple industries as well Um so I want to start just by talking about the theme that I think has been alluded to by you know the speakers today which is that the well-being of workers and the well-being of businesses are interdependent. So investing in your workers is obviously um you know a thing that many companies would aspire to do but many companies also operate on low profit margins. Um if you're talking about labor intensive industries or other uh, or other firms So that means that they have limited capital to take chances on investing in projects which may not have uh financial returns. So to then in order to take action firms need evidence on which programs work and have impact. And um when I say impact I mean impact on the well-being of their workforce but also business impact as well. Um and so in order to generate this evidence at Good Business Lab we use uh academic research to design and evaluate the effectiveness of worker well-being interventions against key business metrics so that includes worker satisfaction productivity uh retention and we measure the impact of an intervention on the firm's bottom line uh to demonstrate that it has financial returns so one of the case studies um i wanted to cover today it's it's on worker voice and why that matters. Uh so what is worker voice? I guess simply put, it has to do with the ability for workers to share their feedback or inputs with management in order to drive change. Um and so Im- imagine a factory shop floor that has 2000 workers. If you're HR or if you're working in that factory, how do you regularly check in on and collect the grievances from such a large workforce? Um because of how difficult this can be, many blue collar workers they they don't have access to safe formal accessible channels of communication to voice their grievances so here's an example of how uh of our research that displays how leveraging worker voice can benefit the employers and workers um in the garment industry here in india wages for frontline workers are essentially tied to government minimum wage policies which is determined at a, at a state level. So a few years back um uh there was a year when workers in general felt disappointed by the wage hike. So we partnered with one of India's largest garment manufacturers, Shahi Exports, and we conducted an experiment to evaluate uh the impact of providing a channel for workers to voice their grievances following this sort of disappointing news that they had about their wage hike. We basically randomly sampled workers to participate in in a paper-based anonymous uh satisfaction survey and we asked respondents for feedback on job conditions, supervisor performance, wages, workplace environment and their overall satisfaction. So in this experiment, we found that workers value even small interventions that shows that show the management's commitment to them. Um in this case the anonymous surveys delivered significant returns um affecting worker retention and attendance that more than paid for the investment of conducting the surveys particularly impacting the most disappointed workers mm. um but these channels of worker voice can take a lot of different forms uh you know uh, we've seen text based tools app based tools it's essentially just a medium for workers to engage in this two way uh ideally anonymous communication with their with their managers um so while we know that these tools can be extremely impactful 
a lot of the tools that are available right now um, don't provide the same level of access for workers. And that's because a lot of them are curated for the context of a white collar workforce or, Mm -hmm. you know, in the context of developing country of developed countries. And then that ignores a lot of important factors uh, that we face here, such as literacy rates, multilingual communication, and even just access to smartphones. Um, so mm. as part of scaling up our research, we developed uh, our own tool, which is a two-way tool, anonymized, uh, multilingual. And we kind of designed it from the ground up with buy-in from management and workers. Um, and it's programmed to fit the contextual needs of frontline labor in a developing country's uh, setting. Mm. Um but Anand, I want to add to the challenges yep. you listed yep. is the challenge of informality, right? So I think bringing the voice of your worker, even from your remotest sort of uh, end of the supply chain, still has some incentive for me as an employer because I get to hear and I get to know, you know, so, I mean, so far we don't even have that, the supply chain mapped out, quite frankly, for yeah even the apex chains, right? Yeah. Uh, but in this totally nebulous kind of, you know, floating population, sea of faces, there is a lot that you you gather when we go to the, the worker facilitation centers and the NACAs, there's a lot of insight and voice to gather. But for yeah. whom and how do we make it count for industry action and yeah. industry mindfulness is, is really the challenge. Any thoughts on, on how we can tap into this voice? Well, I think some of the learnings I was going over, they do transfer to the informal sector as well. I think mm-hmm. having, essentially having an effective communication channel, um, it can improve the well-being of the workers who have access to it, but it can affect business outcomes in the context of, let's say you don't care as much about understanding the re- ground realities in this context, but you do, do care about whether it's a formal or informal worker, you do care about their retention their attendance. And we've seen improvements in those outcomes um, by providing this channel. In addition to that, you know, we see like the rise of worker unions. Um, There's the All India Gig Workers Union. And it's clear that workers want their voices to be heard by management and have a say in the decision making process. So um, that's why, you know, we although we haven't done research in the informal sector with this technology, with this approach, um, you know, we have reason to believe that these learnings could actually be transferable. Mm, thank you. Thanks, Anand. And look forward to coordinating some of these solutions as you go forward. I know we are six minutes away from a wrap. Um, and I think some of the questions that have been raised are also being addressed um, online. Um, while Divya does that and other speakers, please feel free to also uh, chime in. I think just calling attention to a few things that I personally gathered today, uh, but would also share with our community, is that when we began our our journey in the social compact on six outcomes for for our workers, um, these were wages, health and grievance redressal, safety parity, gender parity, future of work and access to entitlements, and future of work for the blue-collared worker, as well as gender parity, were the most contested outcomes for us to focus on, given where we were coming from uh, at, yeah, at you know the, the first stage of the pandemic. I mean, we were so far away from a reality where we could think of the blue-collared worker as potential uh, rather than as just risk to be mitigated, right? That's the boardroom conversation today. Uh, but I think the case of, of Lily kind of defies that. And while it is one case, I think that is where we want to get to with all 200 million workers that we are talking of, that they are potential waiting to be uh, both identified and harnessed effectively uh, so that they can become higher skilled workers, a greater contributor to industry overall, whether or not they stay with you is irrespective. We make those calls 
and those bargains with a white collar worker all the time so why not for the blue collar worker um and a much greater asset to themselves and to their own agency so i think uh you know the vi and i always say where we are coming from and where those outcomes are so contested i think it's it's in, in our faces that this is the way to go and we we are really looking forward to a transformation rather than to incremental changes and that will mean that sometimes we are pushing the needle beyond the point of of comfort I think the second learning both today as well as it came up today you know about regions and diversity and today I think you were speaking about it it's also something we are seeing in our work because uh, a lot of our companies while they are headquartered in Maharashtra have their operations all across India and I think as we go into listening to the voices of workers in whatever shape and form whether you're doing it with socore on your own uh taking into account the differing sensibilities uh, the differing contexts of regions and the language barrier is critical to assuming that you will get to know the truth in in the in the in the click of a button right um and so how do we break some of those barriers and build some of those decentralized pods of trust uh and and people who will listen to those voices locally and then communicate them to the central offices of industry is a critical change that we are uh, hoping to make i think the third one for us uh, to share with everyone is that we have benefited a lot from adopting the enablement approach as opposed to a stick approach to getting industry uh, started on this journey uh and while we often wish there was somebody who was wielding a stick uh somewhere not us uh i think we are strong proponents of the enablement approach of the dialogue approach because that's the only way you will be able to shift minds and frankly without that we are we are going to be as poor as we were before the pandemic uh so the dialogue and building unconventional bridges of dialogue whether it's between apex companies and their third degree supply chain partner whether it is between a worker at the naka and cii and fiki whatever those bridges are we need to build it so that we are able to see that we are we create a community of practice of like minded people who actually want to bring a change and that is really the power we are feeling in our work in the social compact that we are not alone and there is no one constituency that is represented in the action uh, that is being taken last uh, but not the least i think women and women's representation is perhaps that silver bullet waiting to be unleashed uh into the informal sector uh as well as the informal segments of the of the of the uh you know the, the formal sector itself wherever they have come in we have seen productivity go up and the business case is coming to light almost instantly uh i really implore industry to aggressively uh explore this this part of the demographic we may just change the story in a big way makran you have your hand raised you wanted to say something Uh, actually uh, you know we, we were discussing on the gender diversity here and uh, i have just one experience which i wanted to share sure uh, was actually you know we have one vendor in aurangabad uh, uma sons and uh, you know that the the owner of uma sons they have decided that their one of the factory will be completely uh, driven by women only so from uh, you know from cleaning to uh, to uh, until the general manager everybody be will be a woman and mm-hmm. i think it's really uh, i think uh, so somya was also with me and right now almost uh, 80% workforce is women and now mm-hmm. they will be changing the rest of the 20 also so i think this is really very good example uh, yes. which i would i would wanted to talk thank you for sharing and we look forward to more of you joining this movement with us uh, just want to wrap by saying that india has a clear trust advantage in the global market a demographic dividend that we are frankly not doing justice to right now um and we have a platform in the compact that is bringing those who make decisions um and have the power to make change happen with us so do join force join this movement join it with some faith and a little bit of good critic critical and skeptical faculties as well but we look forward to seeing you on the other side thank you so much it's the wrap and have a great evening bye bye